Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. A little over 1,000 kilometers separate Kiev from Vienna, but the two capitals recently seemed to be twin cities. What happened in the Ukraine war apparently loomed over the talks regarding Iran's nuclear program, with final draft of abstinence for assistance ready to be signed but frozen due to Moscow's demands to allow trade with Tehran, despite the economic measures taken against Russia in the Ukrainian context. While diplomacy awaits its restart, the IAEA has made its peace with Iranian atomic authorities despite bitter Israeli opposition. What is the interplay between these two dimensions of the Iranian issue? Joining us from New York City is Dr. Oli Heinonen, who is the former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency and a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us, sir. Also joining us from Central Israel is Mr. Meir Javed Anfa, who is an Iran lecturer at Reichman University. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And with us here in the studio is our TV7 editor at large, as well as the host of Watchmen Talk, Prowage and Play, and so much more, Mr. Amir Oh, And Amir, give us a broader uh, overview of the current state of play. Things seem to be frickle. While we initially thought that uh, the deal in Vienna was pretty much a done deal, so to speak, uh, now it seems that nothing is done until everything is done. So uh, this is uh, now, but now uh, is only a fleeting moment. And uh, perhaps uh, right now, as uh, five or six seconds uh, have already elapsed from uh, when I started to talk, there is a new now. And uh, one uh, uh, recalls the famous book by Barbara Tuckman, The March of uh, Folly, about the events leading uh, up to World War I. Now, uh, in the year 2022, we seem to be in the folly of March, where two uh, separate crises, but uh, in both of them, um, the uh, United States and Russia are very important participants, are uh, having an interrelationship. And uh, the Russians seem to be using Vienna and the apparent American eagerness uh, to have a deal with the Iranians struck in order to elicit some concessions in the Ukraine uh, crisis. But uh, again, one doesn't really know whether the uh, Russian foreign ministry um, is aware of their own leader's uh, mind, Putin's, and whether when uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov speaks, um, he's authorized to say uh, what he has. So things are in a flux. Mr. Javed Anfa, I'd like to start with you. To what degree do you think that at this stage the Iranians feel comfortable enough to re-engage with uh, the United States and other members of the P5 plus one uh, regarding a uh, return to compliance, if you will, with the 2015 nuclear agreement? And to what degree are they willing to do so without the non- nuclear demands, which remain intact, uh, and Iran claims to be uh, red lines with regard specifically to uh, uh, demands of the United States to revocate uh, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards from the designated list of foreign terrorist organizations. Is this something that they're willing to forgo? Um, as uh, Mr. Amir Oren said, uh, this is a uh, this is a situation that changes by the second. Uh, the, the Russians had imposed the, had, had asked for a new, that included a new demand saying that uh, uh, the nuclear deal has to uh, include uh, exceptions. What does that mean? Exceptions that would, despite the fact that there are wide ranging sanctions against Russia, and today Russia is more sanctioned than North Korea. The sanctions against Russia must not apply when it comes to Russia and Iran business trade dealings if and when the JCPOA is, uh, is returned to, if the Iran nuclear deal is reinstated. Um, today, Mr. Amir Abdullahian, uh, the, for, the, for the foreign minister of Iran, went to, um, uh, uh, to Russia. And now the Lavrov is saying the Americans have given, have given us guarantees that the sanctions will not impact our relationship with Iran. Um, to be honest with you, this only confuses the situation more because it's almost impossible that President Biden would dare give such written guarantees to the, to the Russians. So um, 
you know, the, the situation is changing and it's actually becoming more, more uh, convoluted and more difficult to understand. But I think if the Iranians understand that the Russians are also okay with Iran returning to the nuclear deal, then we have to return to the questions, as you quite rightly said, Jonathan, of whether they are willing to cross the Supreme Leader's lines, uh, red lines. Um, one of them being all sanctions being removed, including the sanction, non-nuclear sanctions imposed by Trump. And of course, there's this issue of the IRGC. Um, um, to be honest, we don't know enough yet. All we know is that according to the Europeans um, and the Americans, everything, almost everything has been agreed to, but there are some small out, uh, outstanding issues. Um, what those outstanding issues are, I don't know. But um, we have to wait and see. This is a this is a very difficult moment for for the Iranian Supreme Leader, especially uh, because not only is he facing American demands, uh, if the Russians are still saying that they want sanctions relief and the Americans have not given them the written guarantees, then he could be also be facing Russian demands. So uh, this is a very tough situation for Iran. I think they will push for the IRGC. To be removed of the uh, of the any future sanctions, and I think perhaps President Biden would 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 do that. Yes, indeed, Dr. Hainan, I'd like to ask you. Uh, at the beginning of last week, there was a Board of Governors meeting of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, during which uh, deliberations were focused once again on Iran. Prior to that, we had uh, the IAEA Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi travel to Tehran to reach some sort of deal uh, with the Iranians with, with regard to open standing questions about particles that were unveiled and found in Iran, specifically uh, from undeclared nuclear uh, sites. Uh, and over the course of several years now, the Iranians have failed to provide clear answers with regard to where do those nuclear particles come from and uh, where do they derive from, from what kind of sort uh, of activities. Uh, it seems like the Iranians time and again are inviting uh, the IAEA Director General to visit Tehran before Board of Directors meetings or Board of Governors meetings in order to avoid sanctions. And uh, somebody who is uh, considered to be one of the founding fathers of the nuclear weapon, uh, uh, Mr. Albert Einstein, already provide us, provided us with a clear understanding of what it means to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Is this the case here also? Pretty much, yes. You know, we have seen quite a few of these uh, roadmaps, roads which actually lead nowhere. They have very tight timelines like this current one. In a few days' time, 20th of March, Iran is supposed to provide written answers to the IAEA. Let's see what comes this time. But I will caution one thing. This deals only with the nuclear material and the particles found. This doesn't deal with the PMD as a whole. And I think that it will be interesting to see how this develops when the answers hopefully come from Iran during the spring, how the IAEA, the international community, is going to deal with the PMD issues, because that's the crux of the matter. How far Iran is it nuclear weapon design? Now, in particular, when we see that, for example, 60% enriched uranium stock is just a few kilograms uh, away from that famous threshold for breakout. So this is going to be a very complicated discussion sometime in May, June in the IA year. And I'm afraid that uh, Iran is not able to convince even on this nuclear material the IAEA secretariat. And then IAEA secretariat will be again in the same spot as in December 2015, when the unanswered questions were brushed under the carpet. This is a test for JCPOA if there is an agreement. Nevertheless, when we are hearing what the Chinese have brought up uh, during the discussions, reportedly uh, the PMD or the probable uh, military dimensions of uh, uh, Iran's nuclear activities uh, were rejected. Uh, the uh, Chinese are very clear saying this was an open investigation. It was closed. It doesn't matter that it was a political decision to close this, but it was closed. And now they're demanding that this would be brushed off the table. What should we identify from such a scenario? 
Well, uh, we have heard this before and several times from the mouth of Ambassador Ulyanov from uh, Russia. I don't think it should be brushed under the carpet. And if uh, our administration, Biden administration, agrees that approach, it would be fatal error. It would be fatal error in the Middle East. It will be fatal error or also for Northeast Asia. Those questions need to be answered. Particles were found in the places where military-related R&D was done. For example, those uranium metal chips. They were to do with the uh, uranium deuterium source, which was clearly a weapon-related AMAD project pro, uh, task. So those need to be answered. Otherwise, we will never have a final conclusion on this Iranian issue. And the question then comes that why do they do this enrichment? Why? What is the implication to the Middle East? What are the Saudis thinking? What are the Emirates thinking when they see Iran starting to increase the stocks of enriched uranium in years to come? Indeed. Mr. Javed Anfal, I'd like to follow up on this. Uh, we heard also the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, come out and uh, openly stress that any know-how accumulated over the years, over the several months also for that uh, uh, in particular, with regard to any nuclear advancements, doesn't matter if they're civilian or not, uh, the Islamic Republic does not feel the need or uh, accepts even uh, to relinquish this know-how, uh, which would already be technically unviable, so to speak. Do you see the international community actually acquiescing to uh, the, the Iranian request of, of uh, maintaining that knowledge? And to what degree does that not uh, contradict the, the current uh, agreement in play? Um, first of all, I'd like to say that the, the possible military dimensions, uh, the word possible has to be removed. The military dimensions, we know it, the Mossad documents that were sp spirited out of Tehran, uh, and also, uh, uh, furthermore, uh, remarks by Mr. Abbasi Davani, who is the former head of the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, he said himself that there had been activities, there was uh, uh, military-related activities that had taken that had taken place. And Mr. Fakh, if I'm not mistaken, you also alluded to the fact that Mr. Fakhrizadeh was perhaps also involved in that. So it's not a possible issue. We know there is a military dimension. Whether they're working on it on, right now or not, that's a different issue. But we know the Iranian nuclear program has had a military dimension. Now, in terms of the know-how, so how, so sorry, so how should this should be a showstopper? It, I think, of course, I agree with uh, with uh, Dr. Heinen and that, of course, you know, this is a very bad issue. But the question is, uh, how much political will is there to address it? Um, how much faith does Israel and the international community have in Mr. Grossi? I don't know Mr. Grossi enough to give you an informed answer uh, on that. In terms of the know-how, Jonathan, look, you know, the things that have, the Iranian scientists have learned, they can't unlearn them. This is, this is the, they already have the know-how. The issue here is that will the future, if we go back to the Iran nuclear deal, will we have the same tough inspection regime that the JCPOA introduced? Because right now where we are dealing with reality, um, the, the, our best weapon is that to, to have those inspections because we can't reverse the knowledge that the Iranians have learned. But uh, we, so we need to have a good inspection regime to make sure that they are not using it to make a nuclear weapon, or if they are, we find out as soon as possible. And this is why I think the best possible scenario for Israel is actually to that, that so that the JCPOA 2015 is restored. Indeed, Mr. Owen. Well, there is, of course, um, a contradiction between articles and particles. Articles in various treaties, such as the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and the particles found in various places, mysteriously appearing, uh, even though they're not supposed uh, to be there. Now, Mayor mentioned political will. The fact is that usually what you have uh, is the technical issues being uh, sorted out, and then the gap is between the leaders of the various parties and their political will. Here is the other way around. The political will is there. Uh, Biden wants 
um, an agreement, and apparently Khamenei too. Now they have to, to uh, find the mechanism in order to reflect their uh, political decisions. I and think there needs to be a correction. Khamenei wants sanctions relief. Whether there is an agreement for that or not, he doesn't really care. Yes, but he, right. knows that, he knows that uh, this is the device. Um, and uh, this is uh, the give and take, of course. And he wants all sanctions relieved. Also, uh, this is what uh, President Trump did by uh, sanctioning the IRGC and others saying that this has nothing to do with nuclear. This is terror or malign uh, activities. So uh, the rhetoric doesn't really uh, mind when the Americans held in Iran are released. Biden will celebrate it as the biggest victory ever. And uh, the nuclear file is only secondary. Of course, politicians will also make it appear as if uh, they have uh, the greatest uh, achievement uh, of all. Now, the Israeli delegation to the IAE um, was very bitter during that uh, BOG, the Board of Governors uh, uh, meeting uh, last week, saying, yes, we know that you delegates will go down to the commissary and uh, empty all the uh, champagne shelves and celebrate uh, it as if it's a big victory. But in actuality, the Iranians have been very good students of the Israeli case, especially as regards ambiguity. The Iranians know that Israel will not allow them to become a nuclear weapon state or even a nuclear threshold state. And they don't want to get there, but they do want to wink and to tell the world that they might get there unless they are being bribed. And what is now on the table is only the length and largesse of the bribe. Dr. Heinonen, do you believe the Iranians are not interested in uh, reaching nuclear weapon dimensions? I think that's what they do with these uh, stocks of uranium uh, enriched now. Actually, if you look at the total amount now, uh, 4.5 to uh, 60% enriched uranium. It's enough for, no, for nuclear weapons. Actually, Ahmad's plan was for five. So now they have the stock and they will use, like the North Koreans said to us in uh, January 2003, that our nuclear weapon is no, not nuclear weapon. Our nuclear weapon is separated plutonium. So, and, but then the things changed a little bit, and then finally they made a weapon. So I think that we have the similar scenario in front of us. Now Iran says, yes, we have enriched uranium. We have enough of it. We have a capability to produce more. But don't push us, because we may need to take the next step, and it will be very, very difficult to stop. Because now if we look retroactive, how many times I have went during the last five years to undeclared sites? Tell me the number. Zero. I don't think it's a big number. So it will be difficult. We, we are tied to monitor declared places 24-7, 365, as Secretary Kerry said, almost for nothing. Because if they do it, they do it in the secret place. Indeed. Mr. Javed Anfal, uh, I'd like to ask you the same question. Uh, if scrutiny increases uh, within the current boundaries. You spoke earlier about uh, to what degree is uh, uh, Grossi actually capable of, of uh, uh, having that political will grant him tailwind to uh, provide uh, satisfactory inspections. Uh, well, the mandate granted to him is quite limited. So within that context, if the Iranians are managing to maneuver beyond those boundaries, and uh, still accomplish their desired goals with the alarming figures that uh, Dr. Heinonen just mentioned, uh, considering the fact that uh, when the North Koreans actually broke out, uh, the uh, quantities currently available to the Iranians are far larger than what the uh, North Koreans had back then, uh, that indicates some sort of a challenge ahead. It does. Um, first of all, um uh, Dr. Heinen and uh, saying that it's uh, that the IE has visited zero sites, zero undeclared sites. Uh, that's first of all, it's very concerning. Uh, 
But then again, when we put that next to the information that that famous uh, moving company uh, uh, from Tehran that moved all the documents, shipped them out overnight to Tel Aviv, called Mossad. According to those Mossad to those Mossad files, Iran had not restarted its uh, nuclear uh, military nuclear program uh, after the Iran nuclear deal. So perhaps that could explain uh, why why that is that the IAEA has not made any. Um, any undeclared any visits to undeclared sites of course it is possible that iran had moved some of the some of the uh, equipment as a preliminary move to to do to make a bomb or to test the iaea as was the case in torgozabad uh, that famous warehouse just outside of tehran which nobody had ever heard of until mr netanyahu put it on the map uh, but until now, we haven't heard any any of the of the intelligence agencies, the CIA, the Mossad, or the MI6, say that the Iranians are actually making a nuclear weapon. So this could explain why uh, there haven't been any uh, any visits to undeclared sites. Of course, uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Heinonen is a much better, bigger expert in this regard. But we can't also ignore the fact that there's no report saying that the Iranians are now making a nuclear weapon or have embarked on doing so. Do they have enough uh, enriched uranium to do so if and when, when they decide? Uh, according to information in the open source, of course, they have two thirds of it. Uh, but the whole issue of weaponization takes much longer and that could you know, make the Iranians more vulnerable to exposure if and when they decide to do so. Um, in terms of what Mr. Grossi is going to have to do, really, it really depends on how much pressure he's on, on the, uh, by the Americans. We cannot take politics out of, this, uh, out of the particles in this case, as uh, Mr. Oren so beautifully put it. Uh, we are nearing a U.S. Uh, midterm elections. President, uh, President Biden's numbers are terrible. Even, even the Republicans and some of the crazy cuckoo politicians are doing better than the, than the Democrats. And uh, it is possible that Mr. Biden will decide to pick the lowest hanging fruits from the tree by making many compromises. Or it is also possible that in order to shore up his, uh, his security credentials, he takes a tougher line. It's difficult to say, but uh, politics, as we near the US midterm elections, politics is gonna play a bigger role as one of the elements in this equation. Dr. Heinonen, we have the perfect analogy, obviously, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North Korean case, uh, where the international community was trying to scrutinize everything that uh, the North Koreans uh, were doing, and at the same time failed to uh, provide uh, clarity, since the facts uh, uh, of the matter is, today we already know they have plenty of uh, uh, nuclear weapons with ICBMs capable of delivering nuclear warheads uh, to multiple uh, locations uh, throughout uh, the world. Uh, I'd like to hear your perspective as somebody who had, has dealt with the North Korean case as well as with the Iranian case from uh, the IAEA's perspective. Are the Iranians at a farther stage than where the North Koreans were during uh, their breakout point uh, back when uh, that actually took place? I, I think that the Iranians are in a much better position. Uh, North Korea had not separated plutonium in a very high quantities in 2003 when they broke out from the NPT. They had most likely some small quantities of plutonium which they have hidden uh, before, uh, obtained before the agreed framework and they did those experiments on uranium, plutonium metallurgy somewhere else, not in the uh, declared site which the IAEA was monitoring. So this is an example of how you can maintain and develop your skills. They built their missile forces quietly. They embarked the uranium enrichments, which took also outside of the UN beyond. And I think that this is the problem here with the Iranian deal that so much effort is put on those declared sites. And then when IAEA tries to go like the Turku's Abbas, Abbas, it takes ages to get there. And then you find a discrepancy or need an explanation. Now we have been dealing two years with that and still no answer. I think that this tells you know the, uh, how this current uh, proliferation or non-proliferation enforcement system works or doesn't work. And I, thought, I don't think we should be overly euphoric if some new JCPOA pops up unless the attitude of major players change in the enforcement. 
Mr. Oren, intelligence agencies are obviously at play here, uh, seeking to provide some sort of scrutiny at uh, the absence of the IAEA, uh, where in the past it was to accommodate the IAEA to a certain degree. Were we at this stage? Is the uh, Iranian capacity to break through to a nuclear weapon uh, with the alarming quantities that uh, we hear here from Dr. Heinonen uh, scrutinized to a certain degree, or are they able to also hide certain quantities that would then allow them a shorter period of breakout? It would be naive or illusory to uh, think that almost 80 years, 77 years after Alamogordo, after the first uh, Trinity test of the uh, atomic bomb, a country which is uh, rich enough in resources, especially uh, with scientists uh, and uh, engineers and facilities, cannot work its way towards uh, nuclear weapons if it uh, set uh, its uh, sights on it. And if a country, be it Sweden, Germany, Japan, Italy, Canada, does not do it, it is because uh, it doesn't want to. Iran, uh, apparently, is afraid of Israeli action, which is why when we see non-nuclear blows being exchanged, as was the case recently with the drone uh, war between Israel and Iran, Iran is afraid that Israel will see it as a pretext to preempt its nuclear enterprise, which means that it knows full well that Israel is not a party to try and trick into believing that Iran can be better than its adversary. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Dr. Heinonen, Mr. Javen Anfal, and Mr. Oren for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>